And I think because it's an entire fantasy world and because there have been hundreds of stories, I, what I hear from some people is, oh, I don't know where to start with Conan. And it's like, dude, it's it's easier than Batman. Like, you know, there is less supporting cast. And to be 100% honest, most of them die every story, um, you know, like <laughs> than, than, yeah. than, than any of the superhero books. I don't need to know anything about uh, past adventures. It's it's kind of rare for villains to come back multiple times in a Conan comic anyway. But even if they do, their motivations are very straightforward. 90% of the time, Conan's entering somewhere he's never gone before. Uh, you know, bad things are going to uh, uh, happen because he is the changing influence. You know, he brings war or he brings conflict or he brings a new point of view. He's an outsider. He's a troublemaker. He's a survivor go like that's what you really need to know to dig into conan while many characters in comics have in some ways lost their edge in recent years conan the barbarian remains the greatest badass in all of popular and genre culture a big part of the reason for that is that Conan isn't owned by a corporation, but by the independent Conan Properties, which is ultimately controlled by one man, Friedrich Malmberg, the keeper of the Conan legend. The one who writes Conan's new ongoing Hyborian adventures, though, on behalf of license holder Marvel Comics, is Jim Zub. We spoke with him one year ago, when he had recently been appointed the writer of the regular Conan comic book. But shortly after that, the world went off the rails. Therefore, we caught up with him again to take a look back at the storylines that have been released since we last spoke, the ins and outs of working on a book where Marvel's editorial board in turn answered to Conan properties, and which stories still await Conan in the pages of Marvel Comics. So, we are back again with Jim Zub. And last time we spoke, you had big plans for the year 2020. Now, of course, we spoke uh, before everything went off the rails. I was going to say, I think everybody year. had plans for 2020 yeah. that didn't happen. <laughs> and six years ago, when we talked in 2020, that was an incredible conversation. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, time, uh, time was strange last year. Everything seemed to... Simultaneously, we had no time for anything and all the time in the world. It was really, really weird. Um, yeah, right around this time, we were talking last year, and I was getting ready to launch uh, my run on Conan the Barbarian. And when I say that, I can't help but smile because uh, I'm still having a blast working on the book. But obviously, plans were not um, what we anticipated in any way, shape, or form. Uh, my first issue of the series of the, the new Marvel run was issue number 13, which came out in February of uh, 2020. We had two issues come out, and then the book went on pause as things, the, the whole publishing industry kind of went through a massive upheaval. So you can imagine, you know, it's like a bucket list project. I'm so excited to get this underway. Um, I have to have more uh, scripts written in advance than with a typical kind of Marvel superhero book because of the extra layer of approvals with Conan Properties. Um, and then it just stopped. Everything just sort of held. We ended up holding for six months on Conan the Barbarian. Some books uh, were less, some were more at Marvel. Um, some books were canceled entirely. So um, for me, it was really, it, you know, it, it was strange because uh, you have all this anticipation, you have all this excitement, the art's coming in, everything looks beautiful, the letter proofs and we're ready to roll. And then it was just like, okay, let's hold on. We've got to see where, you know, where things are going and how uh, the industry is going to play out. Um, and so we didn't come back with my third issue until October. So it was literally a six month gap. <clears throat> and we've been monthly since then. So uh, we're now wrapping up my first arc, which I guess would have normally wrapped up in the middle of the summer 2020. Um, but now I'm just looking to the future and, and excited about what we've got you know, planned. And it did give us extra time to plan some of this stuff out and for me to do some extra reading and research. So, you know, it's sort of a, it, it, I wouldn't say it wasn't, it's weird, obviously, you know, and, and you can't look back and constantly pine over what was. Now I'm just really pumped for to see those stories out in the world and for people to read and enjoy them. 
and really, really excited about what we have coming in the second arc, which starts with issue 19, um, which will be, it's available for pre-order now. It's coming out next month. It's coming out in March. Um, and really, really stoked for our new regular artist on the series. So uh, Corey Smith is jumping aboard and he is doing just phenomenal, phenomenal art on the series. But I don't want to get too far ahead. Um, I know when you and I were talking about this before we started the interview, we were saying, let's, you know, dig into that first arc and, and talk about those issues and what we what we covered there. So. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah, of course, we'll get back to what is coming, but uh, but first, let's begin with what has already been. Yeah. Because uh, although it got interrupted midway in there, we, of course, then had Into the Crucible, mm -hmm. which is then your launch story, which began with issue 13. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, as we covered last time, that's not the ideal place to begin. Like, it isn't number one. There's not the right. infinity of the variety covers <laughs> or anything like that right, to try right. to incentive. So let's begin with that. how was the response to issue 13? It was really uh, good, that, uh... actually. Yeah. we. Um, I think we defied expectations a little bit. The readership grew on 13, which is what you always hope for when you have a new creative team come on board, um, you know, compared to uh, not that 12 did poorly or anything, but 13 did see a, a jump up, which was great. A lot of excitement from uh, readers, um, you know, new people coming on board. I think some lapsed readers who came back and then the the hardcore that were sticking with it all the way through. And so uh, they liked Raj's artwork. They were we're excited about the story that we were setting up. Um, we didn't get any complaints about, you know, changing up where we were in the Conan kind of timeline. Like Jason's story covered a huge span of, of Conan's life and kind of ended with him in the, you know, King Conan kind of era. And I didn't want to tell my stories there. I didn't want to just pick up where he left off. Jason's got his own plans for King Conan stuff. So I kind of throttled things back to one of my favorite, you know, eras of Conan. He's younger, a little more impetuous, and and learning more about, uh, you know, the Hyborian Age and and spreading his wings and going places he hasn't gone before, getting himself into trouble. And uh, I love that stuff. I love that that you know he's not world weary yet. He doesn't um, he doesn't have it all figured out. And that uh, is a fun era to kind of play with the character. And so Into the Crucible has him going east, kind of far for the first time. Um, and he gets himself wrapped up in this crazy uh, uh, death tournament. Basically what happens is he ends up in a city um, to sort of the Southeast and he doesn't speak the local language. And that for me became kind of a fun tilt for the story because most of the time in the Conan comics, um, he ends up somewhere else and, and, he speaks the language East. or at the very, uh, the language is being translated in those classic kind of square brackets. Yeah. yeah. The trick say, that's often used is that, uh, is that, um, it's implied that he has already learned the right. gist of the language before the story began. That's one of the things that Roy Thomas kind of like made explicit mm -hmm. that he actually has to learn the language, with right. Multiple references to his barbarous accent long before right. Schwarzenegger had ever portrayed him on screen. So that is something that I thought was really, really cool because here you show him, he's bumbling into a new location or he doesn't right. really know anyone who knows the language. He has kind of tried to get by, which is pretty awesome because that's something we haven't really seen before. Yeah, it was a really fun challenge as well because I didn't want the reader to know what was being said. So I created a language kind of a whole cloth for the series, like not every aspect of the language, but a, a lexicon of words that we would go back to and use on over and over again. And it was a real challenge for Roche because now his artwork had to portray attitude and body language in ways that you know, have to be that much clearer and stronger because you have to infer what these people are thinking or what they want from Conan because he doesn't know exactly what they're saying and, and the reader doesn't know what's being said. So it was this fun thing to come up with words and inflections and then indicate to Raj, okay, you know, this dancer girl clearly wants to bed, you know, Conan, so she's all over him. Or, you know, this guy's super impressed with his strength, so he's slapping him on the back or stuff like that. And so with those kind of obvious interactions, you're like, okay, I get what's happening. I don't need to know the exact verbiage in order to understand these people like him or they want something from him or whatever. But what became the fun kind of twist of the story is when 
their purpose is no longer so clear and Conan gets caught up in this tournament. He thinks he's just doing these feats of strength and he's going to impress upon them. Oh, I'm going to win some beers and be a part of, you know, of a parade or something. And what he doesn't know is he's essentially um, being tested to become a contestant for this, this uh, death tournament that he's going to get thrown into and has no way of knowing what the rules are or what's involved or the dark God that these people worship that's built all around this death tournament. <clears throat> and that was the fun kind of twist of that first issue, throwing him into this situation way, way over his head. He's a little bit drunk. He's a little bit, uh, you know, he's out of his depth. And now he's stuck in this underground dungeon that's full of traps and full of other people, some of which, again, don't speak his language. And only one of them can come out the winner on the other side. This place is, is you know, a contest to entertain and uh, provide blessing for, uh, you know, the people of this city called Garchal. And so, uh, speaking yeah, of cold, I really enjoyed the the name of this death god that this <laughs> entire thing is mentioned for Kali right. Ma. Of course, you have Ch we all Chali know Mai her. is, the, is Ma. the name. Yeah. <laughs> Chali Ma, because you know, I, Ma. I wouldn't want to directly, uh, uh, you know, I I think that that um, in Temple of Doom, when I can't remember the villain's name. Uh, when he pulls the the heart out, and he keeps saying uh, Kalima, Kalima, like that is probably embedded in my brain somewhere. So it's like I need a nasty sounding god. All right, we'll file the serial numbers a bit off that, and this is a cool name, and this will work well. <clears throat> you know, uh, yeah, it was awesome. It was fun to do and to design up that kind of mythology around the god, and and you know how the tournament worked and all this stuff, and and introducing rules or or you know. Um, traditions that were rolled in and around the city and the tournament that as Conan discovers it, the reader discovers it, usually at a really inopportune time for our hero, you know, and just putting as much pressure on him as possible. So in the dungeon, without spoiling too much, he ends up gathering a small group of these other warriors who are also in the tournament and kind of know you know, that only one of them can come out the other side, but but at least if they band together for now, <clears throat> they might be able to survive the traps and creatures that are, you know, in the depths of this place. One of the people that's pulled down there with them is an actual uh, citizen who translates some stuff for Conan initially and uh, doesn't tell him that he's being manipulated. So Conan drags him down when he's being thrown into this pit dungeon. That was hilarious, I have to say. Yeah. And again, putting all this pressure on Conan, he needs this kid to uh to translate stuff for him but he also doesn't trust the kid completely the other people that are in his sort of little group they need each other to try and survive this place each but other. they don't trust and so it's this like the interplay of those those tensions was a lot of fun to do and it riffs on a lot of you know pretty classic <clears throat> storytelling stuff but i'm trying to put little twists on it so you know there's bits of kind of your your battle royale or your, um, I guess, Hunger Games or whatever. There, there's pieces of it that riff on a, um, I love these books when I was a kid called Fighting Fantasy. They were like choose your own adventures, but with a more dice rolling kind of component. They were pretty big in the UK and stuff like that. There's one in particular that they've turned into a video game stuff called The Death Trap Dungeon. And it's very much in a similar kind of style of a tournament of, of death between these warriors. The difference with that one is everyone volunteers. People aren't forced into uh, the tournament. Um, but some of those visceral kind of tricks and traps and illusions and people messing with each other and temporary alliances is very much in that vein um that i really loved about that story and i didn't go back and reread it because i didn't want to copy anything directly but just the feeling that i got as a kid reading that and remembering the you know the atmosphere in and around it and how cool it felt um was something that i was definitely influenced by as i was working on into the crucible and um as things play out uh, you know, Conan's got to survive and, and you, you're pushing the characters in different ways. It's not just the, the, the challenge for me in writing, you know, a character like Conan is there is obviously going to be conflict, physical conflict and everything else, but how can you push him in other ways? How can you force him out of his element or the, the problem solving and the exploration, the traps and the puzzles, those were all, you know, the, the, the ability to forge these temporary alliances between them.
those are all ways that you can really dramatize the situation instead of just, all right, take a sword, hack everyone's head off and away we go. And um, that's what made it so much fun, you know, creating this cast of other warriors and some of them, we see their death directly and some of them get killed kind of off camera and our heroes discover their body later on and oops, well, don't eat that food because clearly it was poisoned because this person's body's laid out with foam all over their mouth or whatever. So just trying to make it feel like there's a larger world, there's stuff happening that, that Conan isn't directly involved with but he will see the results of, and that this city has been around for a long time and these traditions have built up. And I think that some of the best Conan stories come from Conan is this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's this disrupting force, right? He either brings order to chaos or he brings chaos to order. You know what I mean? Like he will change things. He is a force of change. He, he in, ends up in situations and he will, you know, where there needs to be conflict, he will bring conflict. And where there's conflict, he can bring, uh, you know, uh, change the dynamic of that conflict in a big way. And in the case of Garchal, it has this huge <clears throat> tradition around this death tournament and around the worship of the Chalimai. And so Conan arriving there is going to disrupt that in some fashion. He's going to make the tournament uh kind of bends to his will or he's going to change the way people look at the worship of this god or or you know disrupt the leadership that has has um imbued the the citizens with this glory in and around the death tournament uh the crucible you know and and that's where i think it plays on some of those classic robert e howard and roy thomas elements but hopefully in a way people haven't quite seen before and i'm really proud of how it turned out and the response we've got from people has been so cool you know i thought it was really cool and another thing is that you may have uh, aimed for for robert d howard and the best of uh, previous marvel comics mm -hmm. but as a fan of don rosa and um oh and of Karl Barks. Right. Uh, and his work <laughs> is actually something that influenced the Indiana Jones movies. I mean, oh, you neat. even, I actually, you, you even have like an Uncle Scrooge side of the Temple of yes. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, we got some fun little, uh, uh, that's cool that you caught some of that stuff. Yeah, I just, I love putting those little, little details in there. I love having um, fun, uh, uh, callbacks and, and interesting little little bits. You know, I think it's something that, that comics do so well because unlike even a movie where if you do something for a few frames, people can go back and pause it on home video. But in a comic, you can absorb on a panel. You can just watch a moment and you can see details in the background or you can pick up on 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 things in a very um in a very cool way you know yeah right. yeah because like to me it seemed like i don't know if it's intentional in your part or not but like just reading your stories it reminds me a little bit of don rosa and carl barks and like oh, the level of detail uh, that they put in there and also like tonally of course like that that's like more children oriented sure but for us you have sorts of people adventure. getting their heads <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, that yeah. sense of adventure uh that's exactly you know for me like fantasy when I try and summarize what I think sword and sorcery can be, you know, I think uh, heading out into the unknown, it has to be a big part of it. That one of the reasons why fantasy adventure, I think, uh, taps into something very visceral inside of us is this idea of of untapped wilderness or, or the unknown, that we're heading into places we've never been before. We're discovering and we're engaging with these things, whether it's against creatures or cultures or all kinds of stuff. And then the other element is some you can have intense violence and you can have, you know, moral failings and darkness and all this, but there has to also be moments of, of wonderment. There has to be the unexplained and the, the fantastic, you know what I mean? So there's a couple scenes with these ghosts. Um, there's a Hyrcanian, uh, um, I forget what we called them, like a, uh, a soothsayer or whatever. And Conan kind of mocks the guy and says, oh yeah, I've seen you guys begging for change. And you say you're going to contact the dead and help people talk to their old families or whatever. And then this guy does it for real. He contacts the ghosts of the dead that are inside this dungeon. And Conan is sort of taken aback by this magical power. You know, and magic is not front loaded in, in Robert E. Howard or in, you know, the Hyborian age. It's mysterious. It's strange. It's generally bad. You know, um, it's cursed and, and, and 
takes a, a cost from you, you know? And that is one of the big differences when I write Dungeons and Dragons versus something like Conan, where for me, Dungeons and Dragons is front-loaded magic. It's very high fantasy, bright kind of stuff. I still have a lot of, you know, uh, certain things I like about D&D that I play on and focus on, but the magic is, you know, the magic items and are, are more knowable and the spells are more reproducible. You know what I mean? It's less ritualistic and strange. Uh, whereas I feel like the Hyborian Age, it has to be about mystery because we see this through Conan's adventures and he's not uh, a sorcerer. He doesn't call upon these forces. We as readers shouldn't know it either. We should just sort of see their effects. And I feel like that that is more in line with what it should be. And so when this guy calls up these ghosts, there's this creepy and mysterious quality to it and, it. and it has an important kind of purpose to play, but Conan's never going to fully understand those forces. He's not, and he doesn't want to, that's not what he's all about, you know? Um, so yeah, it was just a really cool story to be able to build. And the fun aspect of building that language and then I, I convinced the editorial, we put in the final issue, the fourth part of this four part story, a lexicon in the back matter. Here's all the words of the language here, uh, the Utaran language. And if you want, you can go back and you can sort of pick them out and see what characters were saying or get the, a much better gist of what they were saying. And there's times when characters are essentially lying right to Conan's face. They're saying something very different than their body language. And you can pick up on that and realize that as you um, as you go back through it, which, you know, if if readers do that, then that's obviously like a real vote of confidence that they enjoyed what we did. Yeah, exactly. Now, that, that's one thing that I have enjoyed with, uh, with the Marvel's new run of Conan is that after the story ends, there's something extra there, whether yeah. it be part of a short story or what I really enjoy is also just a map. Showing yes. where, not yeah. just in not just in in your books in the uh, in the uh, Hyborian Age, but also over in Savage uh, Savage Avengers. Oh yeah, they're showing him tracking all yeah. over the world. Yeah, Jerry's having a, a lot really of fun cool. with that book. You know, like, and I know some of the purists. Uh, I'm on a bunch of the um, the Facebook fan pages for Robert E. Howard and for Conan, and I. I I like hearing the discourse, honestly, uh, good or bad. Like, I want to know what the fandom thinks. And I'm really excited about trying to bring them on board and get them to read what I'm doing. And I know some of them are like, ah, oh, Savage Avengers is, is bad news or it's weird or it's not what I want. And it's like, cool, man. But I don't, whether or not that's your opinion on it, I hope it's informed in the sense that you've read it. Because if you're just saying that based on a, a cover image, I don't feel like that's that's a fair judgment, but wh whatever, you know, you got to make your own choices, what you buy, where you put your money. But that being said, I don't think that means it shouldn't exist. Like as long as we have Conan the Barbarian and, and Savage Sword, like those are the pure Hyborian adventures and that's where they should be. And they're kind of uh, airlocked away from other influence stuff. That's great. But then it's fun to play. It's fun to have these other things and to have these crossovers and kooky stuff. You know, like Jerry did Conan 2099, and I don't know that I would have ever done that, but it was fun. It was a fun read, and I complimented him on it because I think that that's how these characters become that much bigger and more iconic. Like saying that Batman shouldn't cross over with Judge Dredd or whatever. Like, man, it's a cool story. That was so badass when I was a kid and I read that, you know. Um when Marvel announced that they got the uh, Alien and the Predator license, instantly people were tweeting at me like, man, you should do Conan Predator. And it's like, I'd be down. That'd be a lot of fun. Don't do it in the main Conan book, obviously. Do it as its own miniseries or special or whatever. And and yeah, just flex. Like, have fun. Make it cool. Get badass art. And if that brings a bunch of Predator fans over to read Conan the Barbarian, and they're like, this character is amazing. And you're like, yeah, he's one of the most important literary characters ever. And there's hundreds of adventures and you welcome aboard like that's the whole point right you know yeah that's uh, that's how i see it too because um it's important to keep them separated because you yeah. do the proper conan storylines and also sure. i have to think uh, that uh, you found a really good way to to do it different from what has right, been before, right. because you have all the original stories that have been adapted uh, to comics multiple right. times, all of them. Uh, we have close to 300 issues of the standard Marvel comics. Dark yeah. Horse had their their run, which started off brilliant, and then plus we don't the need to talk sword. anymore about it, but yeah. Oh, sure. plus, plus the Savage Sword. 
Uh, so, so here is you found like a really good way to continue the adventures of uh, Conan in the Hyborian Age, but at the same time you really kind of have fun with uh, with the Savage right. Avengers. That's how you have to see it. You have to see it as a fun bonus adventure. Right, right. Because and for else... me, it's like Marvel is publishing the book. What is Marvel known best for? Well, man, like take a dip in the pool. That's cool. You know, like. Like, like, just make sure that you've got that other, you know, the ongoing adventures are are what they should be over exactly. here. Exactly. And I feel flagship. the same thing. Exactly. The flagship book is what it is. I feel the same way about Batman or Spider-Man or, or, or any of these characters. Like, you know, man, you wanted, they did Superman Aliens. So like, that's a weird ass crossover. Cool. It's not like it was in action comics. Like, just go do your thing over there and make it cool. Um, so, yeah, that's what has been that honestly like you know i was saying before the challenge for me has been trying to imbue my stories with the feeling of what i liked best about the robert e howard prose and the roy thomas stories but i can never be them i have to be me trying to to imbue these stories with that feeling with that atmosphere with the excitement that i felt as i read them and try as hard as possible to bring some new twist you know when we did the gambler which was my savage sword story uh now two years ago i didn't know that was going to end up being sort of like an audition for the regular monthly book but that was sort of like trying to encompass a a classic conan recipe but mix up the ingredients a little bit and and it worked in the sense the readership liked it conan properties and marvel really liked it and that gave them confidence to offer me the the monthly title uh so instead of it being my mic drop it was like oh now now you've got the you're on stage for real it's uh no joke um but but also a very cool challenge as well because now i can plan out further i can build bigger you know uh stories and and what i always loved about monthly titles when i was a kid was things were not people didn't write for the trade you would have your a plot your b plot your c plot is your classic kind of you know serialized storytelling but and they would sprinkle in these hints or terms or or ideas that would pay off months and months and months later and so i'm trying to do the same thing here so there's characters and um elements that are in um into the crucible that will pay off later on in my run but you can still come on board later and get all you need to out of it but the benefit of starting at issue 13 is all those little references will become that much more important so it's something like um you know the night star sword which ends up defining the the two-parter that happens after into the crucible um it's this powerful blade this uh blade that that is found in kitai but actually has its roots in sort of the pre uh you know the the pre-atlantis and all that kind of stuff um and it is this dark powerful cursed object that um the head of of garchal has just on his wall as an item and um conan ends up taking it because uh uh Naru Lee, the the woman that he's traveling with at one point she says she's there to steal it back because it's an heirloom from katai and she wants to return it to her master and all this kind of stuff conan ends up getting the sword and then in the next two-parter he ends up being um sort of taken over by its power and so that again it, it it's a magical item but it's not magical like it's item. oh it's all good stuff or you know even a cursed magic item is like in in dungeons and dragons oh it's a bad thing okay go to a a cleric and have them cast remove curse or something like in in the world of conan there is no simple answer there is no solution this is going to be a a battle of wills and of souls in order for him to try and regain his own mind as this thing worms its way inside of him and it's dark and unknowable and powerful and strange and and that was a really cool kind of thing to play on um and try and come up with these more like surreal visuals you know conan the barbarian is very much a visceral kind of a physical character and yet in you know i wanted to get in his head not in terms of getting intimate thoughts but like seeing visuals that we couldn't normally see so there's a, a thing we do in in issue 18 where conan is lost in this um hallucination that the sword is making him see of the pre-hyborian kind of era and Conan thinks he's this warrior in Katai. He's wearing like this samurai-esque armor and he's cutting down armies of demons. And it's like, it's a it's the kind of over the top, almost like 
wuxia action you would see in in like big Hong Kong cinema or like wild. You know, it's not what we think of as normal Conan the Barbarian because he's not super powered or imbued with magic. But in this moment, it's very appropriate because it is meant to be this dreamscape, this nightmare that he's trapped into. And we get to show you something that you maybe haven't seen in a Conan comic before, and yet it's grounded in the storytelling. <clears throat> and, and for me, it also harkened back to like, when Chris Claremont would do those kind of psychic battlegrounds in Uncanny X-Men, and he would show you these crazy surreal visuals or, or some of the weird twisted worlds of Steve Ditko in old school Doctor Strange, like that kind of wild ass visuals that you can't normally see in these books, but we've justified it in the story because it's a nightmare because Conan's experiencing it. And the reader isn't tricked in the sense that they, they know it's not real very quickly as they're reading. And they're like, oh man, Conan doesn't even know what's really going on. He actually went into a village and slaughtered a bunch of people because he thought they were demons because he's not seeing reality for what it is. It's like this augmented reality poured over top of his vision. And um, yeah, just something really different that I hadn't seen before in these books, you know? Yeah. I have to ask, what was the uh, inspiration behind the uh, the sword, the uh, the tooth of the night star? I believe it was called. Because yeah. when I when I read it, I I instantly thought of the one true ring. That's one right. and Stormbringer, uh, exactly. Michael, so, the sword yeah, that yeah. Michael it's more yeah. It's very much in a Stormbringer model, um, more so than I think the Lord of the Rings stuff. It's it's it, you know it is this dangerous, powerful blade. And it's a, the battle of wills and all that kind of stuff. So I get to bring, to me, that's a very classic fantasy element, but try and do it in a way that feels that, that it honors, you know, a Conan approach to it, you know, and, and the way Conan is able to resist it is kind of built into who he is. You know, he will not be ruled by someone else. He will not kneel, you know, he's the one who's going to become a king by his own hand. He will not be your servant. And so even though the blade offers him anything he wants and great power and, and he, can, he can slaughter armies and take what he wants, he knows on some fundamental instinctual level that he will not be at the top of the chain, that he will be serving this, this blade's needs. Um, and he does, it fully crystallizes for him when the, when the blade calls him a vessel, that he is something to be filled rather than being full in and of himself. And that kind of, his brain starts to fight back in a very concrete way. And, and that was a really fun sequence to kind of put together. Um, so for me, it's like a little bit kind of Claremont, all those psychic battles, um, <clears throat> you know, that kind of stuff mixed with Moorcock, you know, in, in the Hyborian age as we move eastwards towards Katai. So it was like a couple of these cool influences kind of playing off of each other and doing something, again, I hadn't quite seen before in a Conan comic, and yet it doesn't feel like I'm adding so many wild ingredients that it can't happen, you know? Yeah. That's uh, that's also like a nice recurring thread from the end of Into the Crucible, because again, I don't want to spoil anything for right, those right. that haven't read them yet, which I encourage everyone listening to do, but towards the end there, Conan is also given an offer that yes. you would think that there's no way to rec to to uh, to refuse this, but of course, then his mind is kind of on something else. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, let's just say, he refuses the offer. <laughs> but, right, uh, and and that he has a you know that that core concept of civility versus savagery that is at the at the heart of I think a lot of the Robert E. Howard stories, and that the people that you would on the surface assume are savage are some of the most noble and honorable and true to themselves. And some of the people who build these giant edifices of civility and, and art and, and culture are some of the darkest and least moral, you know, in the world of, of the Hyborian age. And, and Conan is able to sort of cleave through some of that sometimes through his social and usually through his physical, you know, um, and, and that's a perfect example of it where it's like, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of stuff, but it's not just power for power's sake. There has to be a truth beneath it. If there's a lie that, that defines this entire thing, then that's not what he wants. He doesn't want to live a lie. He doesn't want to be a tool or to, to make other people, you know, um, his tool. That's not who he is, you know, and, and that's not to say that he is, you know, he is 
not your classic good heroic character. He does things that help people, but he's also a survivor, you know, and he also can make very quick judgments and say, okay, this is not going to go well. I'm getting the hell out or I'm going to kill my way out if I have to, you know, if you're stupid enough to face me, then you're going to go down. And, and sometimes it can be this interesting thing where, um, I will write a scene and I go, okay, Conan's going to do this. Uh, Conan Properties will send me back notes and they go, we love how this is progressing. What is the justification for this? Like, just want to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of why he's doing the things he's doing. And having to respond to that, to a good editor, to a good feedback, helps crystallize in my mind, like who he is and what his goals are and why he makes the choices he does. And the, over the course of that, it's been really valuable for me in terms of understanding and defining the character for myself as well. So, yeah, uh, indeed. And I think that the, the working relationship you have there uh, appears to have worked where very well, because okay. my understanding is that first, when you write the stories, you first have to have them approved by your editor in Marvel. Right. But then it also has to go to, I presume, either you or Kim Setteberg or Friedrich Malmberg directly in Conan Properties right. that have to get the final stamp of approval. Yeah, Fred's doing most of the, the interactions, I think, on that front. And the notes come through Marvel, but we'll have pretty organic discussions all the way around. Um, <clears throat> and, and Mark, honestly, now has been doing the Conan book, you know, since Marvel took over the license. He's got a really good head for this stuff as well. So he'll, he'll head off a bunch of those questions with, like, same kind of thing. Why is this happening? What are we doing? And sometimes it's just as simple as pointing back to my outline and going, oh, we're setting up for this. And, you know, like Mark is editing on a bunch of books, not just Conan. And so sometimes it's just a quick reminder, like, oh, remember, we got this plot line that's going to pay off later. Oh, yeah, cool. No problem. And other times it's like, oh, I think that's getting lost in the shuffle. You know, let's let's make this a little bit clearer or let's make sure the artist knows exactly what we're planning so that we can you know, pepper in these influences and, and, and symbols and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's what a good editor does. You know, I think people get this idea that, that either editors are like mouthpieces for the corporate or whatever, and their job is to like crush the souls of, of creative teams or vice versa, that I'm just being told what to write. And neither of those things is true. You know, I get to come up with storylines or I pitch these big ideas and then they're coming back to me with questions or they're like, how can we strengthen those core ideas and themes that you have at the heart of this? Or is there a strong enough theme to hold this together? If not, let's dig deeper, let's do more. That's what good editorial does, you know what I mean? They've got to keep in mind the corporate need um, but then trying to make this thing, we, we all have the same goal. Let's make great stories. Let's have them sell a hojillion copies and, and make people happy and excited for what's coming out each month, you know, and everyone's coming at it with that same goal. And if there's ever any kind of, uh, conflict or, or concern about that, I think 90% of it goes away when you just communicate, look, here's why I'm doing this. This is why I think it's going to be a cool story. And then they come and go, oh, I didn't realize, you know, let's strengthen this or let's find a better way to, to, to deliver it. You know what I mean? That's what it is most of the time. Uh, and when I hear about people like getting into protracted arguments with editors or like fighting tooth and nail, it's like, that's a breakdown in communication. That's a breakdown in goals. We're not on the same page. We don't know why we're all doing this, you know? And so for me, it tends to be a thing where I'm like, all right, we got to dial this back. And I haven't had those kinds of issues on Conan. I'm very rarely, honestly, in most of my writing career. And, and the few times that I have, um, I've learned a lot from them in terms of just like, all right, let's dial back. Let's get back to the core of this thing. And, and, set out with the same goal, which is we're all here to make a book we're proud of, you know? Um, and what I'm so happy about now is Fire like, it feels like cylinders. So the new story arc that's coming down the pipe, um, you know, Land of the Lotus. Now we're in Katai proper at the end of uh, issue 18 that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, Conan has been captured by Katai uh, Royal Guards and I don't want to reveal too much about that, but what's clear from the covers and from some of the preview pages um, that are going around already is, is Conan is imprisoned. He's in sort of like this prison caravan of wagons and he's trapped in a country he doesn't know. 
um, with people who certainly don't have his best interests in mind. And as far as they can tell, he's carrying a sword that he shouldn't have. So he is a criminal and, uh, you know, he's going to be uh, held up for his, his crimes. And that leads him down a, a really fascinating kind of path where because he can't blend in, he doesn't look like anyone else in Katai, he, he has to make alliances and find a way to survive. And very quickly, larger forces that are in play politically and, and um, in some cases even supernaturally are looking at Conan as a tool. He's someone that they can use to exert their will or, or um, pay off some of their plans in interesting ways. And I'm really looking forward to readers seeing the kind of interplay of these things. And some of the stuff that we hinted at way back in Into the Crucible, thanks to Naru Lee, some of the things that she says and how the reality of those come to light once Conan's in the thick of it. So... Yeah, that sounds very cool. I look forward to it. And this then, of course, is a jumping point for new readers as well. Yes. It would be yes. better to come in at 13 with Into the Crucible. But what right. I notice, I have to ask if this is coincidental uh, or, or if this was deliberate. Hmm. Because then 19, which is an entry point for new readers, it begins yep. with Conan in captivity. And right. there there is focus on this sword. Now, hmm. this thing here is uh, for those that only know Conan from the movies, from the Schwarzenegger movies. One of the things that they're going to remember is Conan in captivity, and there's focus on this sword. Right. Right. And that's, I feel like we want to make these, that, that iconic leap that people can come on board and go, oh, I don't need to have read the, the previous, you know, 18 issues. Like, this is such iconic material. What is it all about? Conan's in captivity. He's being held for these crimes. This sword is some sort of important focal point. Let's go. That that you need to be able to, you know, the, the classic um, thing they used to say is any issue of a comic could be someone's first. You know, nowadays with digital and with trade paperbacks being so prevalent, that's less of a problem. But in my mind, I still try and hew to that as much as I can, that you do not need to read 1 to 18. Would I prefer that you do? Of course. Would Marvel? Oh. Obviously, they want to sell as many books as possible, but that I could hand that issue to someone and go, you want to know what Conan's all about? You know, dig right in. And, I, and for some reason, when it comes to superhero stuff, I feel like most comic readers know that. Like when we were growing up, my first issue of Amazing Spider-Man was like 231, and I started collecting from there. Um, and I, you know, it was nice it, for me, it felt full when I would read the book and they would reference old storylines and they'd be like, oh man, these guys have fought before, or, oh, that's, you know, an ex-girlfriend or all those kinds of things. It made the world feel alive. Like I had jumped into the middle of this really exciting thing and I could go forward and backward. I could read the new issues and discover them and get really excited about what's coming next month. And I could slowly dig through back issues. And if I couldn't afford some of those, read the official handbook of the marvel universe and and feel like i was now in the know like i had greater knowledge of of the whole um and i think because it's an entire fantasy world and because there have been hundreds of stories I, what i hear from some people is oh i don't know where to start with conan and it's like dude it's it's easier than batman like you know there is less supporting cast and to be 100% honest, most of them die every story, um, you know, like <laughs> than, than, yeah. than, than any of the superhero books. I don't need to know anything about uh, past adventures. It's, it's kind of rare for villains to come back multiple times in a Conan comic anyway. But even if they do, their motivations are very straightforward. 90% of the time, Conan's entering somewhere he's never gone before. Uh, you know, bad things are going to uh, uh, happen because he is the changing influence you know he brings war or he brings conflict or he brings a new point of view he's an outsider he's a troublemaker he's a survivor go like that's what you really need to know to dig into conan if you think the visuals are cool and you think this guy you know crushing uh heads and kicking ass and and betting babes like that's what this stuff is it's big and it's visceral and it's fun and it's escapist that's what you need to know about conan the barbarian 
Okay, yeah. There's one other thing that everyone needs to know as well. Uh, when Marvel reacquired the title, many were worried that oh no, now it's gonna be it's gonna be a PC Conan who can no longer right. kill and who has to be much more respectful <laughs> to women. And that, that, there was nothing to worry about. Uh, sure. Conan well, first of Conan. all, in the classic storytelling, Conan has always respected strength. And he's always respected people who have, you know, their own unique skills and their ability to do things. I don't think Conan has ever been disrespectful in the broader sense. Like he's not, contrary to popular belief, he's not a rape and pillage guy. You know what I mean? Like uh, uh, that's not the way that he's been portrayed in any of the stories, in any of the classic stories either. But that being said, um, Conan is violent as hell. Like he kills you know, as needed all the time. And in my stories, he does that like crazy. Uh, you know, it, it was so funny because when the issue came out where, you know, he has, there's a sex scene. It's all off camera and kind of silhouettes as you do in the classic sense, you know, the, the fade to black kind of stuff. And people were like, oh, Conan's, you know, getting it on. And I'm like, yeah, have you never read a Conan comic before? Like, uh, you know, pretty girl, this is going to happen. That's how we do, you know. Um, and, and the killing stuff, if you compare it to the classic Roy Thomas comics, we can get away with more violence on panel now because of just changing cultural norms. The Savage Sword series was where they could have nudity and more of that violence. But I'd say our violence is on par with anything in, in the classic Savage Sword. Like, literal heads being lopped off. There's a sequence in Into the Crucible where a character, Conan, is, is attacking this other gladiator and she reaches out to grab his blade just to stop him. And he takes off all of her fingers with a swipe of his blade. And I, when I wrote that script, I said, you know, just like infer it in silhouette or whatever. And Raj just drew it, like all the fingers getting lopped off. And I thought, well, that's not going to get approved. Well, it went through. I thought, all right, I guess we're, I guess we can, you know, do that on, on camera. That's crazy. Um, you know, and so sometimes... And sometimes you can you can show a lot and you can describe more in the narrative, you know. Um, and but I don't hold back on any of that stuff. I write some just absolutely vicious, uh, 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 you know, fight scenes in these comics, and then it's kind of a our job as visual storytellers, you know, when when Corey or Raj or whoever the artist is on that issue, we've got to kind of solve the equation. Like, okay, what what can we show on camera? And you know, in a classic horror film something off camera or inferred can be scarier and freakier because our imagination is always going to be more powerful anyways. So there are times that cutting away can be more effective or describing something. Someone's expression as they see violence can almost be more heart stopping than just seeing a sword going through someone's chest, you know? Yeah. Indeed. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, everyone do check out uh, Conan the Barbarian issue 19, which is yeah. the next entry point. So make sure to uh, to either order that uh, directly uh, or have your local retailer order that for you. Support your local retailer, the few ones which happen to be left. Yeah, big time. Like, pre-orders are so massive. I don't think people realize one of the things i hear so many times from readers they're like oh why was this book canceled or you know oh i just got into this and i just found out that there's a limited run because you know that creative team wrapped up or whatever why didn't this keep going and it's like honestly as much as social media hype is great and and marketing and all that stuff but at the end of the day the numbers are the only thing that the publishers really really understand so if the into the crucible trade sells really well that tells marvel this is the way I like to see Conan the Barbarian. This is the kind of adventure I want to read. If people are buying the monthly issues and the, the numbers rise or stabilize, then that says this is the Conan the Barbarian that we want. This is why we read this book. Nothing else will will matter. You know what I mean? Um, in the grand scheme of, of my run on the book. And I mean, to the publisher. It matters to me, obviously. And I want to make the best stories I can. And I want to be on the book for as long as I can. And, you know, my proving ground is, are the readers coming out for it? Are retailers confident in it? You know, do the Robert E. Howard faithful feel like this is tapping into something, you know, visceral for them as well? And so if you're at all interested, if you've never read Conan the Barbarian, 
man, I'm amazed you stayed on this video this long. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's the best feeling uh, imaginable that I was able to grab your attention. Um, go out and, and pre-order the book. If you're a lapsed reader of Conan the Barbarian, you love the old Savage Sword, or you you grabbed uh, first couple issues of Jason Aaron's, or whatever you, you know combination you're reading a, on Savage Avengers, give the book a shot. Um, you know, let me know what you think of it. Pre-order 19 and 20. Give me two issues to really knock your socks off. And I guarantee Corey's art is worth the price of admission, if nothing else. Like, I think my words are pretty sharp, but Corey's artwork on this series is the best stuff of his career. He is having so much fun. And it's like every issue, he's getting stronger. And I think the first issue looks phenomenal. And by the time we get to 21, 22, it's like... I am. Sta I wrote the thing, and I'm staggered sometimes at what he's drawing for the visuals. Like it makes me so excited to open up my inbox, get an email from him, see those new pages, and just like my head is blown right off. Like I need, I I want to live up to that art. So I want to write even cooler adventures into the future. Um, you know, Marvel's got this dual numbering that they do on the series. So they've got the the numbering for the relaunch. So, you know, the upcoming arc starts on 19, but that's also, oh, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. It's like 290 something. We're, we're on the cusp of issue 300 for the legacy numbering of the series. And uh, I am really, really pumped for that because in the fall, I want to say September or October, uh, issue 300, which will be 25 of the current run, is going to come out. And that's my first time ever doing a big anniversary issue at Marvel or anywhere. Um, and I, I know how much, how cool those were when I was a kid and how excited I got about those big numbers. Cause you knew big, cool story stuff was going to happen. They're going to pull out all the stops with like a badass cover and pinups and just awesome stuff in the book as a whole. And, uh, you know, we're ramping up something really special for 300. So you can, you can read the, the six issues or 12 issues before it get really pumped. And then we're going to, you know, take it to the top with the big anniversary. It sounds awesome. Look forward to it. But of course, you have done other things outside of Conan as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, for instance, years ago, like a decade ago, you did Suicide Squad. Tell us <laughs> about that. Oh, man. Uh, that is a weird story. Um, <clears throat> so what happened was that was my first big two. Uh, the big two, if people don't know, is like Marvel and DC. That's what they call them in the North American comic business. Uh, my first big two script ever was an inventory issue of Suicide Squad. So to give people a bit of backstory, inventory issues were a thing in the 70s and 80s. The books now ship on, you know, they tell you when it's going to come into stores, but shipping schedules change and books get delayed or sometimes they get double shipped. The, it's rarely a perfectly monthly book always coming out on whatever, the first week of the month or the last week of the month or whatever, the way it used to. In the 70s and 80s, these books were like, because they were doing newsstand, they had to promise and deliver on them, right? So if Spider-Man comes out the second week of the month, it's coming out every second week of every month. That's just how it is. Um, and so because creative teams, things happen, and sometimes people are running late, but, you know, people get sick and, and stuff gets lost in the mail because this is before electronic mail and things like that. So in order to make sure they always had a book to ship, they would have a series of these inventory issues. They would be self-contained, done in one stories, very iconic, different creative teams, ready to go at a moment's notice that they could drop into place. It was a, it was a, a way to keep the books on schedule, but it was also a way to test new talent because you could bring in an artist to draw one issue and see how they did. You could lavish more attention and give them feedback while they were learning their craft. Same thing with the writers. They could show you what they think an iconic, whatever, you know, Daredevil or Spider-Man or, or Wonder Woman or any of these characters, what they were. Um, and when, when uh, the New 52 launched at DC, they promised retailers these books would be on time for sure. And so they instituted a similar policy internally where they developed a series of inventory issues, test out new talent so on and so forth. And so Pat McCallum was the editor of Suicide Squad for the New 52. And he reached out to me because he liked Skull Kickers. Skull Kickers was my uh, action comedy uh, sword and sorcery book that I did at Image. And it was about these morally dubious jackasses getting themselves into trouble. Seems very Suicide Squad in terms of its broad, uh, you know, gray kind of anti-hero implications. And so Pat reached out to me and said, hey, are you interested 
in, you know, pitching me some ideas for some done in one stories. I'm thinking, man, this is the first time I've ever written anything for Marvel or DC. What an amazing, cool opportunity. So I really ground out on it and busted my ass and came up with a bunch of story ideas. He picked one of them that we developed into a one-off issue called 20 minute marathon. And the concept was 20 pages, 20 minutes. Every minute is a page on the story. It's counting down to zero and this big explosive finale with Deadshot. He is dropped into the middle of this high action, high octane kind of, of um, you know, sequence. It was a ton of fun to put together. I flexed really hard and tried to make it really cool. <clears throat> Pat really liked it. But of course, it would only get produced if they needed an inventory issue. And much to my dismay, Suicide Squad never needed an inventory issue for them to develop it. So I thought, oh, well, you know, it was a cool opportunity. I got the chance to pitch on DC stuff. Other editors in the DC office saw it, read it, liked it. And that gave me the opportunity to pitch on other stuff and kind of um, proved myself in that that whatever you want to call it, higher level or, or that level of, of uh, you know, superhero publishing and what may have you. Um, it would eventually lead to an opportunity where I did a two-part Legends of the Dark Knight story for Hank Canals in, in uh, the digital office, went over very well and kind of, you know, got my feet wet on working with the big two characters and things like that. All that to say, many years later, five years later to be exact, um, Brian Cunningham was the editor of the relaunch of Suicide Squad that they were doing around the movie. So the movie's coming out, so they got a new number one. Jim Lee's gonna be drawing the, the book. Um, I'm blanking on the writer's name, I apologize. Um, but again, they wanna make sure that the book is coming out aggressively. I think they were overshipping it, so it was more than monthly. And they were worried about having enough material. So one of uh, Brian's jobs is to make sure they've got backup material. He goes through and, before they're gonna hire new writers, he quite wisely digs through the archives and goes, do we have anything, you know? Finds my script, emails me out of the blue and says, I love this, this is so cool. Did we pay for it? And because he couldn't find a record of it because it's been, you know, different groups and different uh, uh, things changing. Um, they had paid for it, it was their script, they could do what they wanted with it. He's like, I wanna get this drawn. I want this thing out in the world. And I was like, awesome. <clears throat> you know, I would love to see it uh, out there. Um, I think I'm a better writer than I was five years ago. We talked back and forth. Andy Curry, who was the um, assistant editor who was helping him on the series, um, read it over and we talked and he was like, I think we need someone for Deadshot to play off of because so much of it is internal. Uh, and I agreed 100%. And I was like, let's put Harley Quinn in the mix. I loved writing her in Legends of Dark Knight. I think she's a great character. Obviously, visibility wise, she's a fan favorite. I think this will be great. He's all business. She's wacky trouble. Let's let's do this thing. And so I added her into the script and it worked. Like it really sparkled even more than, than the original. Um, and then we talked about what artists would be a good fit. Who can get that kinetic look? Who can make this feel like it's pulse pounding on every single page? And one of the, the most amazing new talents in comics, you know, it's rare that you see someone whose work is instantly recognizable and different. Like most artists, I feel like have their influences they wear on their sleeves, you know, and over time they develop a style that's more their own <clears throat> as they get more confidence. And Trad Moore's a guy that seemed to explode onto comics with something that didn't quite look like anyone else and yet was also confident and cool and badass. And I love the way he draws action. I love the way he draws a feeling. Everything feels like it's moving even when characters are standing still. And so he's like, let me, let me call him up. Trad would be great. Trad was super, I mean, there was a movie coming out and Harley Quinn and Deadshot. So he was instantly on board and uh, he put together these really cool designs for it and he busted out the issue. Lo and behold, the way schedules go and things change and plans change, the issue never gets released. It's colored, it's lettered, it's finished and it, and it doesn't come out. They don't end up needing it with the publishing schedule. And, and it's like, I don't know how, I don't want to sound too crass, but it's like this like blue balls moment. Like, my God, we've got this cool thing for years. It's been sitting there in all these forms and still hasn't come out. Oh, well, that's the way this stuff goes sometimes. And, and you sort of go off and do your own thing. And then lo and behold, um, things have changed over at DC. There's a whole new regime over there and they're going through material. They're, you know, uh, figuring out what they've got and making plans for the future. 
and um, that issue of Suicide Squad is found. And uh, Katie Kubert contacts me and she says, hey, we're going to put together this digital first initiative called uh, Let Them Live. And the, the premise, if you want to call it that, is Ambush Bug, who's this ridiculous character at DC, literally stealing old comics that have never been released from the DC vaults and unleashing them onto the readership. And yours uh, popped up and we want to use it as the first issue. And so here we are, the script I wrote in 2011, all that rambling story. 2011, I wrote it. 2016, it was illustrated. 2021, uh, it was finally released and people got to read it and tell me how much fun it was, how perfect Trad was for it. And um, it feels like a vindication. It feels like, 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 not to get too dramatic about it, but like, I've done all sorts of really cool high profile projects. I've worked on the Avengers and Dungeons and Dragons and Samurai Jack and all the stuff I'm super proud of. But that little, like it, that little thing felt like the one that got away. Like it was this cool, neat, neat, neat little thing that I always wanted people to read. And now having it out there, it's like, I don't know, it's like ex exercising old demons or something. Like, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you know, wouldn't that be cool, you know, to do more stuff over at DC and, and play with these toys. But even if that's the only thing that comes out now, uh, I'm glad it's out there. And I, and way back, like in 2016, I bought a page of original art, the splash page from that issue. And I've had it like framed on my wall and no one can see it. Like people come over my house and they see it, but I don't, I haven't posted about it online before because, you know, it wasn't out there. It wasn't released and now it is. So that's my, rambling what was that 10 minutes about my my dc issue of suicide squad <laughs> that's yeah. very cool uh outside of uh, the upcoming issue 19 of conan yeah. the barbarian what else do you have coming out that people should check out right so i've got um the fourth issue of stranger things and dungeons and dragons is coming out jody hauser and i co-wrote that series um it's basically broadening uh the, the game side of Stranger Things. If you love the series on Netflix, I mean, so many people do, that nostalgia that the kids have around 80s Dungeons and Dragons, it shows you how they started playing D&D, which they don't show you in the show. So we start before the show even began. And it takes us all the way through season three and the changes in their lives and the way that the game has exemplified their friendship and the bond that they have between them. And that was a huge nostalgia bomb for me to be able to go back and, um, that's the era of DD I basically started playing in. So kind of reconnect with that and rekindle kind of that feeling and try and bring that to the page. Why tabletop role-playing games are so great, how they build lifelong friendships and, and how that escapist um, exercise can strengthen other parts of you and your life, even though you're pretending. You know, it's still it's still about being courageous, about being bold and about being creative. And that's what was so much fun to put together. Jody's been writing all the Stranger Things comics over at Dark Horse for years. She knows those characters inside out. And so she dealt with a lot of the like the characterization and their relationship stuff. And I dealt with a lot of the game material and we just gelled really, really well. And hilariously, we're now in a gaming group together. So we will play on Zoom like usually once a week with our friends. And so it's built up a great camaraderie, I think, between us as well, which is super cool. Um, so the fourth issue of that, Fourth of War, comes out very soon. And the trade will be coming out this summer. Um, I've also got uh, Stone Star, which is a creator-owned book that Max Dunbar and I do over at Comixology. The, the elevator pitch on that is it's a like a roving space station um, that is a gladiatorial arena that goes across the galaxy. So this gladiatorial arena travels from planet to planet and wherever it arrives, they bring danger and mystery and, and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, it's a colorful, a little bit uh, kind of more youthful series that Max and I are putting together and he's done just brilliant designs on the book. Um, every page is a knockout. Espen Grundhirn is our colorist and he is phenomenal. He's one of the best in the business. The book is a beaut. So if you you know, uh, if you are on a Kindle Unlimited or uh, Amazon Prime, you can actually read it for free as part of the Comicsology uh, package over there. So if you got Amazon Prime, you have no reason not to go read Stone Star right now for free and see what all the excitement is about. Um, lastly, I've got Young Squadron. So 
Marvel's doing this thing called Heroes Reborn. I know that name carries with it all the connotations of of the the '90s, um, you know, era stuff. But they've recontextualized it, much like they did with Hickman's kind of Secret Wars. Um, in this case, it's the Squadron Supreme, which is kind of Marvel's wink and nod to the distinguished competition. Um, is taking the role of the Avengers in this world. And how does that create a ripple effect that changes the Marvel universe that you know in cool and fun ways? Uh, Jason Aaron and Ed McGinnis have come up with some just really, really fun, kooky kind of takes on classic superhero tropes, Marvel stuff mixed with uh, you know other elements and, and see how it all plays out. And I was given the task, they said, look, you know, you did, some cool stuff on the champions. What if we took those the the core trio of the champions, Miles Morales, Kamala Khan, and Sam Alexander? How would they be re envisioned in this new version of the world? And so Stephen Cummings and I, who worked together on Wayward and Champions back in the day, he and I came on board, came up with these new designs, playing a, a real kind of classic, almost Silver Age sort of feel. So it's very hopeful and idealistic and and hard on your sleeve kind of kooky classic super heroics um being and, and playing that against a darker element with a character like like deadpool and so these hopeful you know go-getter kids are going to come up against this strange and violent kind of force and uh kind of pull back the veil on on some of their idealism in a really uh fun way and so that's been a really fun project to work on i'm thrilled to be in the mix on it uh, Carl Kershaw did an awesome cover for the issue, and I can't wait for people to read it. You know, and it's it's a one shot, so it's like, I know some people were like, "Oh man, what are you doing?" I love you know Spider Man, and I love Nova, and I love Ms. Marvel. <clears throat> it's a one shot, guys. Come in with an open mind, read it, have some fun with it, and uh, know that it you know we're just coming at it from a really just just like cool super heroics play in the sandbox kind of way. Very cool. All right, everyone, check that out. And uh, with that, Jim's up. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.